Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, the only item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the EU withdrawal bill from Michael Russell, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. Mr Russell is accompanied today by officials from the Scottish Government, Constitution Policy Team, Gerald Byrne, the Team Leader, and Luke McBratney, the Policy Officer. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. Members have received copies of the Scottish Government Supplementary Legislative Consent Memorandum, which includes proposed amendments to the Bill from both the Scottish and UK Governments, as well as a draft proposed intergovernmental agreement on the Bill and the establishment of common frameworks, and a Scottish Government overview of amendments that have been made to the Bill at Westminster. Uh, members should note that the, uh, we'll need to conclude our session by 11.30. Mike Russell has other commitments which he needs to fulfil in his diary. I'm pretty sure we'll be finished by that time anyway, I hope, Minister. Um, but before we move to any questions, I wonder if you'd like to make an opening statement. I, I wasn't intending to. I'd be quite happy just to ask, answer questions. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, I thought you would. But I'll, I'll, but, um, <laughs> the, so just for the record in that case, um, what's the Scottish Government's view of clause... 2.4 of Amendment 1, which defines the Scottish Parliament's consent, and that's of the UK's obviously the most recent uh, proposed amendments, which can fight, um, define Scottish Parliament's consent as a decision to agree a motion consenting to the laying of a draft, a decision not to agree a motion consenting to the laying of a draft, and a decision to agree a motion refusing to consent to the laying of a draft. In all accounts, it would seem that in every case, consent is given. Uh, that is our view of the clause. I, I think the kindest thing you can say about it is that it is carelessly drafted. Uh, but it is a very unfortunate clause. Um, and it, it, the, the problem with the amendments in the name of Lord Callanan is that they do not, in our view, uh, take into uh, the bill the commitments that are in the proposed intergovernmental memorandum. That, for example, that clause, is nowhere related, uh, uh, referred to in the intergovernmental memorandum, the, the, the document which we are asked to sign. And you must look at, you must look at the package uh, that has been brought forward by the UK government to understand what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. I think our position on that package is not only clear but principled and I hope will be accepted, which is it is possible to reach a deal, but the deal has to be reached on the basis of respect for the devolved settlement. And Minister, uh, uh, I'd like to get some of your views, and I've seen some accusations in the media and, else, and elsewhere about suggestions that in some way the Scottish Government want to have a veto as a result of the proposals you, that the Scottish Government and yourself put forward in response to the recent um, amendments laid by the UK Government. What would your view be of that accusation? I don't think it's uh, true or fair. Uh, I think the reality, I think this is really important, uh, convener. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to address this, because the issue at stake, the issue which you know, later today I'll be going <coughs> to the JMC in Whitehall, and I want to make this position clear before I go and when I'm there, uh, the issue at stake is changes to the devolved competences. That is the issue at stake, without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Um, were we to come to a position where we could, we could agree, it would be because either that proposal was withdrawn, the proposal in Clause 11, or the uh, bill was amended in such a way that we reverted to what is the normal process in devolution in order to discuss and agree changes to competence. That's what it's about. Um, it is not about a veto on any individual item, because once you have the frameworks agreed by means of a Section 30 order, and then thereafter the operation of the frameworks are governed in a different way. And the operation of the grain frameworks will be governed by the normal processes, including the Sewell process. Uh, I don't like the situation where, in the end, Westminster is sovereign. I, I would prefer a different constitutional outcome. But that's not what I'm either endeavouring to achieve in these negotiations or, or it's not something that we could achieve in these negotiations. Um, what I'm trying to do is to make sure that devolution is protected and the way in which devolution operates is not undermined by a proposal which would uniquely, for the first time ever in devolution, give the right to UK ministers uh, to use secondary legislation 
to alter the devolved competencies of the Scottish Parliament, the things for which we are responsible. That would be the first time that had, that had, had ever happened, um, and it shouldn't happen. And I don't think, uh, on reflection, many people in Scotland would support that happening. And therefore, it's not about vetoing individual decisions of frameworks. We can establish frameworks. I'm sure we can establish them. I'm sure we can operate them. That's what the deep dive process has been about, to work that out. What this is about is making sure that the existing arrangements in devolution continue to operate so that the competencies are changed only with the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Now, I know that all members here um, would like still to find that there to be an agreement between the two governments. I think that's quite clear between everyone you've just committed just said yourself you want to see that. Therefore, I wonder if you would confirm that if Clause 11 is removed from the bill, the Scottish Government would be happy to sign an amended intergovernmental agreement in which you would provide a political commitment not to bring forward legislation in areas where common frameworks are likely to be needed. And this is essentially would have the same effect as, as the Clause 11 regulations. Yes. Uh, with, 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 without equivocation, because we have said there are two options. That is one of them, uh, a, a situation where Clause 11 disappears. Uh, the other one is to amend the bill, to amend the amendments, uh, so that we have a situation that reverts to the normal use of Section 30 and Section 63. That would be the normal thing that would happen. So those are the choices. They're both on the table. And if either of those were to be brought forward, they would happen. Now, it may be later today that uh, uh, the, the second choice will be subject to amendments which have been laid by Lord Hope and and Lord Mackay of Clash Fern. I don't know yet whether that will come to a vote in the, in the House of Lords or not. They are tabled. But that would be a way forward. And it would be a very helpful way forward. And it would be a way forward that would conclude this matter. OK, Minister. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, um, I, I hope that you would accept that we were all agreed around the table, um, and indeed all five parties represented in this Parliament including the Scottish Conservatives, were agreed that the original Clause 11 was not fit for purpose and that it needed to be, in the words of this committee, removed or replaced. Absolutely. Um, would, would you accept that it has been reversed by force of the amendments tabled last week in Lord Callanan, Callanan's name, in the sense that the original Clause 11 held all uh, competences um, until UK ministers decided to, as it were, hand them back, and that has, that has been reversed? Um, I'm not sure I would use the term reversed. I think there has been progress in softening the edges of the issue. Uh, I don't think it removes the basic difficulty. And one of the ways it doesn't do that, and you talk about it, you know, all the competences, it is still open-ended. Because uh, it, the process is such that any item, additional item, could be introduced into this process and we would not be in a position to consent to it. It's ago that the amendment and the um, intergovernmental agreement and the mem memorandum of understanding had to be understood together because they come as a package, and I very strongly agree with that. But if you're serious about that, and I hope that you are, then that's not quite the case, is it, what you just said? Because there is a list in uh, the uh, accompanying political documents that sit alongside the memorandum of the areas in which that power is, it is anticipated that that power be used. So yeah, it's not open-ended. But, the, but there is there's, a there's caveat. There is agreement between the government no, no, about, there is what, a, about the areas that we're talking about. There is a caveat in that list, and, and you know, that has been something that has been featured in our discussions throughout the, the whole period. And I understand why there's a caveat in it, but that caveat is, is an open-ended possibility of other items being brought in. It was expressed, first of all, in the JMC process as being just in case there were any items that had been overlooked. But in reality, if we consent to a process which is a, a secondary legislation process of altering competence, that can be used for anything. And, and there's no restraint upon the UK... There is no restraint upon the UK government for so doing. Now, it can't, what, I mean, it can't be used for anything because I mean, that's, um, uh, section 30A, subsection one, which is in the relevant amendment, uh, um, confines the exercise of this power only to legislation which seeks to modify retained EU law. So it cannot be mm -hmm. used for anything. It can only be used within the scope 
of retained EU law. In other words, it can only be used within the scope of powers which this Parliament does not currently have, because the exercise of those powers would be contrary to EU law, which would make it unlawful well, for us to exercise But it does powers. not restrain it to the 24, no, as you've been indicating. It, 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 it is restricted it to, to retained EU law, is that correct? It, it retains it to the 111, and the 111 are which very wide, yeah. because one of the difficulties one of the difficulties in the Welsh proposed Welsh approach, and this becomes very technical, my apologies for it, but one of the difficulties in the proposed Welsh approach, which was a schedule to the bill, uh, which was something that was under discussion until comparatively recently, is the difficulty of unpicking what are headlines in the 111 and delving into them deeply enough to understand all their implications. If you look at the 24 in which we've done the deep dive, that has taken a very considerable period of time and has covered very wide-ranging areas. If you look at number one on the list, agricultural support, it's an enormously wide area. Now, actually, that definition brings in all the other ones up to 111. Uh, and indeed, even that is not exhaustive, because the UK government uh, uh, retains to itself the right to say there is, for example, 112th, which we have overlooked, you know, and that needs to be added to the list too. So it is, with respect, open-ended. Uh, and in being open-ended, it allows the alteration of competences, as I say, uh, by act of ministers, not by primary legislation. It's open-ended it's open subject to um, the power only being um, available with regard to retained EU law. That's not negotiable. I mean, that's, that's in black and white in, in, in the amendment. I mean, the whole bill is only concerned with retained EU. And it is very, very wide indeed. And I've indicated each item right. you have to unpack. So it's not as if it says that's an item on its own and it only refers to one thing. Those items are very wide range. <coughs> right, OK. Moving on. As you know, um, you know, despite our occasional disagreements, we have been trying to reach agreement uh, really? on, on this issue. Um, and as you also know, you know, we have supported the view of the Scottish and Welsh governments um, that... Brexit, including the European Union withdrawal bill, needs to be delivered compatibly with and not incompatibly with the fundamentals of our devolution settlement. Would you accept that the Seoul Convention is one of the fundamentals of our devolution settlement? It's a, it, it is an absolutely essential part of our constitutional settlement, given that Westminster uh, <coughs> regards itself and is regarded in our settlement as sovereign. Yeah. And would you not also accept, then, that the force of the amendments in Lord Callanan's name, and this is the difference between Lord Callanan's amendments now at report stage compared with Lord Callanan's amendments earlier in uh, committee stage in the House of Lords, the force of Lord Callanan's current amendments at this stage is essentially to copy and paste the Seal Convention, which, as you've just said, is one of the fundamentals, one of the essential fundamentals of our devolution settlement, uh, into the Clause 11 process, so that... Sewell says that the Westminster Parliament may not normally legislate on devolved matters without the consent of this Parliament. Fine. That's exactly what the revised Clause 11 says, that a, a power will not normally be taken into the holding pattern that Clause 11 represents without the consent of this Parliament. So it's a direct copying and pasting of one of the fundamentals of our devolution settlement in order to reverse the effect of the original Clause 11, which was incompatible with devolution, to make it now compatible with devolution. And that is why the Welsh have signed up to it. Is that not, uh, is that not an accurate constitutional analysis of the... Of the Where of the are the words not normally in Callanan's amendments? Um, in, uh, in section 30A, subsection, is, 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 what, is, what consent, is what the consent decision provision is. It's what the consent decision provision is. Where are the sub, words sub, not normally three in and four. it? Because they're not there. Well, as it, again, what, I go back to what you said at the beginning, Minister. You said that this has to be understood alongside the Memorandum of Understanding and the Intergovernmental Agreement as a package, and those words are in that package. But, but this is the bit that becomes law. Well, indeed, but the Seal Convention... This is the bit that becomes law, the and this bit does not have the words not normally. The Seal Convention is called the Seal Convention because it is a non-legal rule of constitutional behaviour. That's what constitutional conventions are. But, but this um, is... It's not, you, know, you won't find the Seal Convention... <laughs> In, but but uh, this statute. is the bit. This is the bit which becomes law, regrettably. You know, so it's not a package, and, and it's badly. And it, so no, it's not and a package anymore. It, no, I, I've not said that, and I'm happy to confirm it is a package. But this is a bit that becomes law. Yeah. And this bit does not, in my view, cut and paste in that way. The the the, the Seoul Convention. The Seoul Convention is essential, but the Seoul Convention applies to the operation of the frameworks. It does not apply to, in our view, it should not apply in these circumstances 
to the changes to legislative competence, because changes to legislative competence are done uh, by a Section 30 order, or they can be done by primary legislation, yes, but in this case, we're saying, and the amendments from Lord Hope indicate yes. the way in which that could happen. I, I understand that, but th th there is the fundamental disagreement, I think, between us, Minister, with respect, is that you know, th this is not correctly understood as a change in legislative competence, because we are dealing only with modifications to retained EU law, and it is currently out with our competence to make modifications to retained EU law, because we are not able, as a matter of law, to uh, pass law, and you're not able as a minister to make regulations which are contrary to EU law. So it isn't, an, it isn't a change to our competences. Well, the Seal Convention is, of course, in law, because in the 2016 Act, yeah. uh, as you know, you were involved with, with that Act. The, rea the problem with that is then in the Miller case, the, what we thought was a, perhaps a, a, a stronger intention the UK government to recognise that was weakened as a result of the UK government's um, submissions in that case. So I think Sewell is essential, and you have to look at devolution as a set of fragile compromises. You know, essentially, in a system in which there is, there is Westminster sovereignty, which I don't agree with, I would much rather that wasn't there and I'd like to change that, but in a system that has Westminster sovereignty, what the Sewell Convention is, is a way to guarantee some opportunities and rights whilst respecting Westminster sovereignty. Now, now I accept that that is the case, right? So it is very fragile. And it, what the UK government is trying to do is undermining and damaging the fragility of the devolution settlement by essentially introducing a concept of being able to change legislative competence of the parliaments the, the, with, without uh, seeking the consent of the parliaments. And that's the spirit as well as the letter of Sewell, and that's where the problem is. And it would be far better if we, you know, and, and I do accept that you have been, and your party in Scotland has been supportive of trying to get this right, it would be far better then that we chose one of the two options that are on the table. Uh, we put on the table either withdraw Clause 11, which is where we were last July, and if only we had, we had done it and, and persuaded people to do it then, it would have saved an awful lot of work over the last 10 months, or make sure that in the legislation we are recognising absolutely the, the, the way in which competence can be changed. That's what we should do. I've got one final question, because the, the convener's been very indulgent, for which many thanks. But my final question is this. Um, uh, uh, given what you've said about the importance of the package, but also the importance of words being on the face of statute, even at this 11th hour, would, it, would the Scottish Government accept um, that the deal is done if the words not normally were written into the text of section 30A, no, no, which is in Amendment 18. No, I've indicated how the deal can be done, uh, and I, I'm not being difficult in any way about that. I've indicated the way in which the deal can be done. So agree with the, agree with it. the Scottish Government or bust? <coughs> no, 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 absolutely. No, pr no, agree with devolution and accept the devolved settlement or remove the, the clause. That's where we are. Uh, and that, that, is, that is how the deal can be done. And it doesn't do anything, it doesn't move forward an inch an argument against devolution. What it says is we are going to protect that because that's what we think is the right thing for the people of Scotland and in their interests. That's how the deal can be done and that's how I would like to do it. I could do it today. Ashton. Oh, sorry, apologies. Willie, you wanted in this area as well. Apologies. Yeah, but. thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. It's just in the same area, really. This whole idea of the, the consent to uh, uh, amendments in the, to the bill there. Could you clarify just for the ordinary person in the street, Minister, what this actually means? From, from my reading of it, uh, a decision to agree a motion and a decision not to agree a motion is to, taken to be the same outcome. Well, for the person in the street, it simply means that if, if everybody in the Scottish Parliament, every single one of the 129 members said no, Westman would say, thank you, that means you've agreed. I mean, that's what it means. Uh, so in actual fact, it does mean that language doesn't mean what language should mean. I mean, you were, you were very kind, I think, in your opening remarks about that, but surely that, that's the worst example of something that you would expect to see in Monty Python's. Well, you and I are of a certain vintage. We enjoyed Monty Python. I'm not sure I would laugh at this very much, however. You know, I think this is a pretty outrageous piece of drafting. Uh, and, I, and I do think it would have been sensible, if UK ministers were really thinking about it, to have looked at that. It's on page one, after all. You don't need to even go to page two and say, hang on a minute, that's not going to go down very well. But instead, it just, and not only that, you know, I think advice has been given that maybe that wasn't helpful. But that's where we are. 
Can you, can you can you just be absolutely straight with people of the committee and the Scottish people? Are, are are you asking for anything other than what we have at the moment yeah. in terms of the devolution? The, 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 what we are saying is that the, all the devolution legislation has a backstop in it, which says several backstops in it, which says in the end Westminster is sovereign. In the end, Westminster can choose to do what it wants to do. But for 19 years, we've been able to operate a system with its checks and balances, a fragile system that has allowed people to get on with their business and to do it as well as possible. And all the parties in the parliament, all the parties in the parliament have been involved in that. This is the first occasion on which there has been an attempt by a UK government to alter the terms of that, not openly and above board by coming in and saying, there's what we plan to do for the following reasons, but to do it and to continue to do it for a considerable period of time by secondary legislation. And that's unacceptable. That was never envisaged. It has never been envisaged. And it, 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 it's not uh, something we could, any parliament could accept. So if this goes ahead, if this, these amendments go through, in your view, what does that do to the principles of devolution that were set up in 1999? It undermines them and it damages devolution. And my own view is that that could lead to further damage being done. But the institution is important, but it's not as important as the people. And in, in areas of great importance to the Scottish people, it damages what the Scottish Parliament can do for them. It damages the way in which we can serve people in Scotland. Uh, in all of, you know, all of these areas, and possibly many others, as I've indicated to, to, to Mr Tompkins. You know, um, Ross Finney from uh, uh, the Food Agency was on the radio this morning, talking about the way in which he feels this process will undermine the work that they are doing, for example, against obesity, the work they are doing to protect food standards. And that's really important. That's a direct effect upon the people of Scotland. Because you actually have in here, number 16, food compositional standards, 17, food labelling. You have a whole range of, of these issues. So for the people of Scotland, this isn't some game amongst politicians. This is real damage to the way they lead their lives. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Willie. Uh, sorry for that earlier. Calling you earlier prematurely. Can That's you okay, convener. Um, so the UK withdrawal bill, as it's currently sitting at the moment, um, doesn't respect the devolution settlement. So the Scottish government has then put forward two um, different options. So obviously, we've touched on that slightly already. So the first one is just removal of clause 11, which the Scottish government has consistently spoken about for quite some time now. And the second one is a little bit more complicated. So that's the one where there would be an acceptance of a power on Scottish ministers to restrict the competence of the Scottish Parliament. But it would be subject to this order and council process, which would um, involve the express consent of the Parliament. So the first option there is obviously a bit more self-explanatory, although you might want to explain how that works with the Scottish Continuity Bill that we recently passed here. Um, the second one, more of a, a halfway house option. Could you explain this order and council process and how that might work? Well, I, I, I'm quite sure that Mr Byrne is, is going to be much better explaining the order and council process than I am. But in, in terms of the first one, let me just uh, you know, make it clear that not having... So I've landed him in it now. <laughs> I'm giving him a moment or two to prepare his, his answer. The... The first one uh, is, is essentially we revert to the status quo, and we show respect for each other. I mean, I gave evidence to the um, Westminster Public Accounts Committee this week, and, and you know, in my evidence, I said I did think the relationship of trust between the two governments was at a very low ebb, um, and you know, it is expressed by the fact that the proposal is to legislatively constrain the, the Welsh and the Scottish uh, governments and, and Northern Ireland but simply for the UK government to enter into a voluntary agreement. Now, you know, there isn't the trust in the system that, that would give me any confidence in that. If you take this out, then I think, that, and you say, we'll just, we're just going to work together, I think that begins to restore trust, because then you have to work together. And that's been the nature of devolution. I mean, the, the successful intergovernmental work has been based on the fact that you can sit down and talk to people, and, and that's what works. So I think the clause should go. Uh, that doesn't actually affect the continuity bill. Uh, you would then simply operate frameworks on a voluntary basis. And you know, we're, we've said we're willing to do so, and, and as a convener indicated at the start of this meeting, we're willing to s sign an, a, an agreement on that, you know, and, you know, and, and to say we won't reason unreasonably withhold uh, agreement to things, we'll find ways to work together on this. That's perfectly possible to do. The second one uh, essentially simply reverts to what the normal system of devolution would be, and is in terms of changes to legislative competence. And you need such a system to approve by both parliaments, and, and Gerald will say in a minute how it works, 
uh, for positive and negative reasons. Uh, and the negative reasons are you wouldn't want changes to devolve competence that didn't actually come alongside resource, you know, given the system we operate in. So if you had a system that operated that you could simply say, we are going to transfer all these powers to you, uh, but we're not giving you any money, Westminster might vote for that, but the Scottish Parliament wouldn't vote for that. So this is a good, balanced way in which you would operate. Uh, perhaps Errol could say a word about what a, an ordering council actually is. Um, yeah, the, di the difference between regulation and ordering council and ordering council is formally made, as it says in the amendments, by Her Majesty, by ordering council, that is the Privy Council. And she does it, but so Her Majesty makes the order on the advice of the Privy Council. What the mechanism proposed here is says is that advice cannot be given to Her Majesty unless the draft of the regulations has been laid and approved by both Houses of Westminster and the Scottish Parliament. And that's what's known as a Type A procedure under the Scotland Act 1998. It's how Section 30 and Section 63 work at the moment. Section 30 is the procedure for adjusting legislative competence. 63 is the procedure for adjusting executive competence of ministers. So both the administration and the legislature are protected in the way the minister has just described. I mean, just to make a point on the procedure, um, although it sounds a bit archaic, it's a, it's a non-trivial point that the ordering council procedure is used when both parliaments are involved in uh, approving regulations rather than a UK minister formally making the regulations after approval here because it recognises the interests of both parliaments um, in the order that is eventually made uh, by Her Majesty in Council. Could I point out to perhaps that the laid and approved is important. The word approved there means what it means in the dictionary. It, it isn't subject to uh, what the definition is in the rather odd definition of a consent decision. It means Parliament has to say yes. So we vote um, a simple majority? Mm -hmm. yes. It's a simple majority in, in all three um, legislative, uh, legislative houses. Yes. Sorry, can I just check one thing there? Because that was quite interesting, what Gerald Byrne just said there about the Section 30 order process. Because yeah. those who designed the Scotland Act, when they sat down and thought about how, how devolved competencies could be changed, given your description of order, uh, a Section 30 order, had obviously that particular process in mind for any change to competency that came about. I hadn't appreciated that so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and moreover, you know, th there was those who, who, who were setting this up were also in a position of understanding this would be a parliament of minorities. So a majority, you know, it, it, you know would require, probably, and, and certainly in this parliament, require, in all the parliaments we've had to save one, more than one party supporting it. So can I just make one other point on that, Kavina, which is that the Sewell Convention, as it operates, also respects the procedures in Section 30 and Section 63, so that approval of this parliament under the Sewell Convention is required for changes to competence yeah. as well as for acting in devolved areas by the Westminster Parliament. Yeah. And that's how it's been operated um, for 19 years. Well, that, was, that was useful for, to get my head around why the, 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 the Scottish Government are so centrally focused on that. That's helpful. Sorry, Ash. I just want to follow up by asking about the amendments. So there's been amendments laid in the House of Lords, I think it was yesterday, by Lord Hope and Mackay. Um, and so you've said that if they were accepted, that the Scottish Government would recommend consent to the bill as a whole. Um, do you think there's any likelihood that those amendments... Oh, no I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not Mystic Meg. I can't tell you what the House of Lords is going to do. It will be up to the House of Lords. There are conventions there, but not everything is put to a vote. Uh, very often issues are raised in order to allow the government to consider them. There is another amending stage still to come, uh, which is the, the third reading. Uh, but you know, I, I, I'm very grateful for the work the whole range of members of the House of Lords have done. Uh, Lords Hope, Mackay of Clash Fern, uh, David Steele, uh, Jim Wallace, uh, Daffod Wigley, just to name a few of the peers who have, been, who have discussed this on a regular basis. And you know that discussion will obviously continue, um, but you know it's up to the lords to consider this. I, I know uh, you know Lord Hope will have will have views on it. Uh, Lord Hope, uh, you know, and, and Lord Mackay are very distinguished lawyers, and they are approaching this in a, in a legal way. But I think it is the issue of how you allow the devolved settlement to continue to operate effectively that is at the centre of their minds. Okay, thank you. No, Patrick, you were interested in the lawyers. I was going to bring you in later, but I'm going to bring you immediately after James Kelly now, since we've got into that area already. Okay, uh, thank you, convener. Um, I, I mean, I suppose the kind of fundamental issue in all this is about dispute resolution. Um, as I understand it, the Scottish Government's objection to the amendments that have been laid by the UK Government uh, is that 
uh, where there's a disagreement between the governments in terms of where retained EU law should be allocated, the, 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 the arbiter in that dispute essentially is the House of Commons. Um, the Scottish Government, under, with some understanding, uh, you know, uh, are uncomfortable with that and, and therefore you've put forward these two alternatives. And in, in terms of the second alternative, which uh, Mr. Burns just been discussing in relation to the, the order of the Council and the use of a type A categorisation categorization where uh, consent is required by both parliaments. Um, what, if there's a disagreement in terms of both parliaments, what's the dispute resolution there? Well, there isn't one in the sense that this is how you change devolved competence. And you would negotiate uh, you know, until you got an, a, an agreement to change devolved competence. You know, it, it, this has, argument has often been put to say, well, you know, there needs to be a resolution in that case. You know, somebody needs to win in this, so automatically it has to be the UK. Well, actually, that's true in devolution. You know, at the end of the day, there's already the power for the UK uh, government to say in devolution, sorry, you know, but we're going to do it our way. Uh, and I don't like that. You know, I, I think that's wrong, but that exists. So the dispute resolution is built into the system, but so is the requirement or the expectation that there will be meaningful discussion and negotiation, and that it will be done openly and above board by the parliaments. What we're talking about in terms of the system that's being talked about here is to be done by secondary legislation by ministers, and that's not the same thing. I understand what has been proposed in, the, in terms of you're trying to get the consent of both parliaments, but is there not a weakness in that if the parliaments end up at loggerheads, uh, there's no mechanism for resolving the dispute? With respect, there is. The UK government can, can decide what it wants to do. Uh, yeah. that, 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 that is also the weakness, and I agree it is a weakness, that is also the weakness, for example, in the JMC dispute resolution procedure, where at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if three out of the four countries uh, involved in the JMC say we don't like this, the UK government is in the end the arbiter of the process. Now, that is devolution. Uh, you know, and you know, I'm not happy that that's the case, and you know, I think other people aren't happy with the case, but that's the case. There is a dispute resolution procedure, and it is as I've described it. You've repeatedly said throughout this that you're, you're seeking to protect the devolution settlement. Um, can you give an assurance uh, as this situation develops that that's your central aim? and you won't use the situation in order to try and trigger a second independence referendum? I, 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 in, the, in these negotiations, I've made it clear from the beginning, I'm endeavouring to get an agreement, because my view is that does two things. Uh, and this is, I think that's very helpful, because I, I, I'm able to point this out. First of all, it creates, it solves this issue of the, it, how we deal with the repatriation of powers which is an important issue. I don't like Brexit. I don't think it's a good idea. I think it will end in tears. But I've always said this legal work needs to be done. So that's the first thing, and that's what I'm seeking to do. And, you know, it's been a long 10 months. I'd be quite pleased if we were able to get that. But the second thing it does is it lays the groundwork for further legislation that deals with the legalities um, of, of the EU exit and what follows thereafter. For example, in an agriculture bill, in a fishing bill, and subsequent bills. It, mean, it makes it easier for those things to happen in a way that we can concentrate on the political issues rather than concentrate on the technical issues. So I am seeking, and I'll give you that absolute assurance, to get a resolution to this on the basis of the devolved settlement. You know, I, I do not like the devolved settlement, and I'm absolutely clear I'd like to change it, but the process in which I am engaged is trying to make sure that the devolved settlement is not damaged by this process and we come to a conclusion on these issues. Patrick. Thanks very much. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago, you, you referred to the, the, the new uh, amendments that have been lodged in the, in the House of Lords. I think they, they may have been lodged on Monday. I, I only saw them on, uh, on Tuesday, and uh, I'm not going to pretend to have had a, uh, an extensive opportunity to, to fully understand them. I hope the government has. You tweeted yesterday some very useful amendments now tabled in the House of Lords for the discussion of the EU withdrawal bill devolution clauses tomorrow. Um, you were tweeting yesterday, so that's a discussion that will happen today. We don't obviously know what's going to happen in terms of whether they'll be put to the vote, but they'll at least be debated. You said, grateful to Lord Hope, Lord Mackay, Clash Perrin, David Steele, Jim Wallace and David Wigley for trying to help resolve current difficulties. 
I wonder if you could just uh, give the government's reaction to the detail of, of those yeah. amendments without the Twitter character limit. <laughs> Don't take that too far, though. No, no indeed, I would. Uh, OK, there, there are two separate strands running in this. There's the amendments that the Scottish Government drafted, which were sent to the Lord Speaker by the First Minister at the weekend. And uh, they, they were in two sets. There's a set that allows Clause 11 to be removed. There's a set that uh, creates the circumstances in which um, the Section 30 and Section 63 orders would apply. It's that second set that's been tabled by Lord Hope and, and, and Lord Mackay. So clearly these amendments, we know they're very technical. Uh, I do accept that they are very technical. But essentially what they do is they do the second job, right? There's another set of amendments uh, which are tabled in variety of names. Uh, Wigley is a supporter of some, um, <coughs> which have different uh, effects. They don't do the full job, I have to say, but they, they help to take this issue a bit fo further forward. For example, one of them that I think has Jim Wallace and David Steele's support, certainly Jim Wallace's support and David Wigley's, I think I, I, David Steele will be supporting it, um, is to do with nothing coming into effect until it has been accepted by the, 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 devolved, the devolved parliaments. So in other words, it, the, the, there's, it would create a space for further negotiation until we were all happy with this, and then we would be asked to, to vote on it. So those are helpful. Now, there are other amendments down, uh, you know, a variety of amendments, but we're not, we, don't, we don't have anybody in the House of Lords. That's entirely right and proper. That's, we believe that's the, the thing we should do. Um, so we have been, as we were with the Welsh Government on the last occasion with these, putting forward ideas and putting forward amendments because amending bills is, as everybody in this room knows, technical, you know, and it's useful to get lawyers and others engaged in it. So we've been helping with that and having a dialogue about it. And you know what, it's been very, very helpful. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I very much respect um, uh, both Lord Hope and Lords Mackay. I, I, they are very distinguished lawyers. They understand things far better than I understand them. And they've approached this from a legal perspective and have been helpful. You know, they're not approaching it from a political perspective, but they've been helpful. So, so in short, within this group, there are some which would fully implement the yeah. second option that the yeah. Scottish Government has been proposing? Yes. yes, and that and that you would be happy with. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, if those were passed, yeah, that would conclude the matter. If those were passed, or if the or if the UK government Accept a, accepted yes. that it would do mm -hmm. something similar or very mm -hmm. very similar, that yes. would effectively resolve the mm -hmm. the impasse between the two governments. Subject to the approval of the Parliament, yes, it would certainly allow me to recommend that. There, there are one or two others uh, in this this batch, um, which uh, I wonder if you could just react to. In particular, one from uh, David Wigley about. Uh, the joint ministerial committee idea, and which uh, suggests that uh, that joint ministerial committee could take some actions when a majority uh, of the governments uh, agreed to it. Uh, it. At the moment, that would be, uh, I suppose, two out of three, uh, which leaves open the possibility uh, that a, not only that uh, a Scottish government would have to accept a decision being imposed upon it, but leaving aside the particular perspective of Scotland, that, uh, in theory, a, a majority government might be uh, capable of being told, effectively, to accept a position decided by two minority governments. Uh, would it be reasonable to assume the Scottish government uh, isn't convinced that this is the right approach to shared decision-making? Well, I think it's got... It's got interesting elements in it, and, and I'm, not, I'm not using that in dismissively in any way. It's not a new idea. Mm -hmm. it, was in the Welsh government paper last August on these issues. Um, you know, it has been refined a little. The element of the Council of Ministers was in an amendment from Lord Mackay at uh, the second stage in the House of Lords. So it's worth discussing. Uh, it would need to be worked through very carefully. You know, it, it essentially it works on the basis of pooling not sovereignty is the wrong word, but pooling responsibility in order to operate. Now, it formalises that. Um, it doesn't deal with the issue of consent to change with legislative competence. I don't think you could accept such a, a way of operating in terms of changing legislative competence. Mm -hmm. But in terms of decision making, you know, within a, a group of ministers who were deciding details of a policy, you know, it could be a way forward. But it would have to be well put together in terms of a rule book. Everybody would have to know how it would operate. Um, I think it's it would be the exception rather than the rule. We've, for example, if you look at the issue of fisheries, 
There are good intergovernmental relationships which govern <coughs> difficult issues, issues that have arisen as part of the European you know, common fisheries policy, which have operated without formalizing it on that basis. Because they're operated on the basis that there is a shared interest in getting this right, and therefore people work on it. It, it is an idea that's worth discussing. i tell you what is really important here in the Commons Public Accounts Committee session was focusing on this too. There needs to be a discussion of the relationships in these islands post-Brexit. Yep. And uh, you know, I think the Welsh have been very constructive and positive about starting that discussion mm -hmm. and pushing it forward. Uh, we've not been quite as quick on it, but you know, I think we, we, we are keen to take part in it. Uh, parts of the House of Commons, Bernard Jenkins' committee is focused on it. Mm -hmm. UK government doesn't seem to want to talk about it yet. And of course, in Northern Ireland, there's a hiatus in the situation. So it might push us to have those conversations. Yeah, I, I, I think our experience, uh, some of us were at the, uh, the, the, the UK Parliament Committee on, uh, on Monday as well, and I think notwithstanding there are some very significant disagreements in this whole area, the, the willingness to engage in that dialogue is not one of them. Uh, I, I think just, just finally can I uh, clarify that you're saying that in relation to this particular amendment, there's the, there's the basis of a useful idea, but this isn't its final form. No, and, and I don't think David Wigley would say it was yeah. its final form. I mean, in the House of Lords, there is a, you know, a, a respectable and, and strong tradition of raising ideas and, yeah. and having debate. <coughs> and <coughs> you can only get to speak if you normally if you put in an amendment. So that also has a, an effect on it. OK, thank you. Neil, you were interested in sunset clause issues. Yeah, just briefly, can I clarify before that? Um, the Scottish Government's preferred option would be that clause 11 is removed entirely. Is that your preferred uh, option? No, th there are two options. I mean, we are... We, are, it, 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 we have an equivalent support for both, uh, which is either to remove Clause 11 okay. or to have these amendments. And do you have any other, have you considered any other options? Uh, not at the moment, but you know, if someone had to come with a set of proposals that uh, met our objective, which is to ensure that the uh, it, devolved competence can only be changed uh, with the agreement of the Parliament, uh, then of course we would consider it. But that's the core issue. Okay. On the issue of sunset clause, I asked you in your statement last week about uh, time frames, and you said it was an issue of time frame um, and consent. I know there is an amendment in the House of Lords which would seek to limit the, mm -hmm. the length of the, the sunset clause. It's some, a sunset clause is something the Labour Party has called for, it's something the Scottish and Welsh governments have called for, and it's something that's um, now proposed in the bill. I um, appreciate you have a principled objection to the to the consent issue. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the, the practicalities. It has been suggested that the UK government would be unlikely to impose a framework, or there'd be little point in the UK imposing a framework in that in that sunset clause period because if the Scottish government or the Welsh government could then reject that at a later point. What would you what would your response be to that suggestion and the practicalities of how it would work? I think you've got to differentiate between the consent to the establishment of the frameworks and the operation of the frameworks. In terms of the consent of the establishment of, of, of the frameworks, uh, then I think it, it is perfectly feasible uh, for imposition to take place, although the UK government said it will not impose. So I think that's a conundrum which you know, the committee may wish to ask David Mundell, who was very clear they shouldn't mm -hmm. be imposed. Uh, so I think that, that is <coughs> the case. In terms of the operation of the frameworks, uh, then I do think that uh, if that is a subject as, uh, as the, 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 the proposal is to be subject to Sewell in terms of legislation and the normal process of intergovernmental activity, uh, then I think that that can operate quite effectively. You know? uh, so I don't think the sunset clause really affects both. The issue of the sunset clause, in my view, is that seven years is a long time. And you know, if you have a change of competence to which you have not agreed, you know, and, and you're bound by it for seven years. That's a very long time. And the seven-year figure comes from the two years and the five years added together. So at the very end of the existence of the, of the, of the first power, you're doing something that has a five-year life. It's a long period of time. So that's my difficulty with it. Um, but it's not my biggest difficulty with this bill. You know, the biggest difficulty is the one which we're focused on. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you were interested in the same area, I think. Yeah, yeah thanks, convener. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You just mentioned the seven-year issue, and I'm interested in maybe exploring that so that people understand exactly what it means. I mean, um, could you help explain a wee bit about that? And do you think it's reasonable to assume that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish, on behalf of Scottish people, should agree that it's reasonable to transfer powers for seven years so that technically the UK government can do whatever they want for up to seven years? 
Well, um, it wouldn't be reasonable if that was what took place. Um, I don't want that to take place. Uh, but if you know, the, the, I make this distinction, and I think it's a really important distinction between establishing the frameworks, that is changing the competence of the parliament, and the operation of the frameworks, which is an intergovernmental activity governed by the normal rules. Now, you, know, you and I would, would like that system to be different. Uh, you know, we would like a much more equitable system. But within the existing system, I think one has to say uh, it is a, cannot be agreed that there should be a unilateral change by secondary legislation by fiat of ministers of devolved competence. That's not acceptable. However, if the Scottish Parliament accepts that these frameworks should exist, then it should, I, I can't imagine that thereafter, it would be difficult about saying as long as the normal processes took place, then we would be able to operate them. So it's, the, it's that initial thing that is the real issue. And if that is the thing that is done without consent, then the, the seven year period becomes really intolerable because you're doing something, being forced to do something to which you did not agree. So just a wee quick sup, does that mean it's reasonable that Westminster could then take control over GM crops or fracking or something it's, like that. It's perfectly feasible as long as, as Mr. Tompkins has, has pointed out, uh, those are matters that lie within that list of, of 111. Now, as it happens, both of those, I think, probably do. Mm. Well, hydrocarbons was in it. It's on the list of 111. <coughs> Well, it, 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 let's, let's clarify this because there's a bit of comment back and forth. Can you can, can you describe this? What you understand well, uh, was it, uh, was, as part of that 111 was were GM crops in it or were yeah, I think GM crops are undoubtedly in it in, in terms of how this operates. In terms of hydrocarbons, I, I remember they were somewhere on the list of 111. But can I can I because this, this is not the central point? Yeah, can we write to you about that correct, point? Correct. Fine. Just let's get that clarified. Um, Emma, is that you concluded? Well, thanks. Ivan, did we still have some areas to go on the yeah. self To kind of just tidy up on that, I think we've kind of mentioned uh, in, in passing, but it was round about the um, proposed intergovernmental inter agreement um, and the, uh, the, the, the concept that the UK government would retain the power to restrict the competence of the Scottish Parliament, um, but would just give an undertaking that they would wouldn't do likewise, and there's clearly an imbalance there. Um, I understand the Scottish Government's proposal was that that should be balanced so that both would give the undertaking, but the Scottish Government in a Parliament wouldn't be constrained by legislation. just want to talk through how, that, mm. how you see that in terms in of imbalance. In the best of all possible issue. worlds, which clearly we are not presently in, but we're eye-hoping, um, you know, in, in that world, we would have a relationship based on trust, mm -hmm. the two governments. And, and they, you know, the UK Government would say to us, you know, we hope that you don't do this, and we would say we hope you don't do that, and we'll sign a bit of paper, and neither of us is going to do it, and that's fine. But what is being proposed, of course, is that there is a legislative restriction, you know, upon the devolved administrations, all of them. Uh, you know, the, the Northern Ireland one isn't presently in session, but all of them. But no legislative restriction on the UK. Now, this is allegedly because the UK is sovereign and cannot and will not be bound in that way. Um, but that, that's a bit problematic because, you know, who knows who will be in government next month, next year, whatever. But, you know, entering into a voluntary restraint and then saying, well, actually, the circumstances have changed is perfectly feasible. And there's nothing that can be done about it. Okay. Whereas if you enter into a legislative constraint, you can be held to it. Now, that, that doesn't seem to be sensible. And it doesn't follow you know, the pattern of devolution. I mean, the more you think about this the more I suspect people would say, why don't we just stick with the system we've got? Because it's worked for 19 years and there's no reason why it shouldn't continue to work. And that is uh, the second set of, of amendments. That's the option where we, we accept that the Section 30 process and the Section 63 process are what have, has worked. Um, and we operate that. And this is about, and I stress this again, this is about changes to legislative competence, changes to the powers of the Parliament. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Now, um, Murdo. I think you would, it is a Welsh government, Scottish yes. government. Yes, uh, thank you, Camino. Yes, I'd, I'd ask a bit about the relationship between the, the Scottish government stance and that of the Welsh government. And you, Minister, worked very closely with your counterpart in Wales, uh, Mark uh, Drakeford. Um, you've told us in the past um, that, and this is a quote from something you told the committee last year, uh, we are working very closely with Wales and we cannot envisage a situation in which Scotland would be content and Wales would not be or vice versa. Uh, and separately, you've talked about how 
uh, you and your Welsh counterpart are, uh, quote, uh, worked in lockstep and also that you are in, again, I quote, exactly the same position. Uh, so clearly that was the position up until about a week ago. Um, it's not the position anymore. Why has the Welsh Government, in your view, now been able to find compromise with the UK Government and reach an agreement, and you haven't? Well, I think we found compromise in the sense that you know, the discussion we're having is very different from the discussion we were having you know, last July, but we've not reached final agreement. Well, you know, I'm tempted to say, Mr. Fraser, that you must ask Mark Drake for that, not me, you know, because it's clear he's responsible. But I will see him this afternoon. Uh, indeed, I'll be in the Welsh Government offices this afternoon where we'll have our pre-meeting, as, as we sometimes do. Uh, and, you know, we will discuss a range of issues that will come up in JMC, most of which we will agree on, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. On this central issue, uh, there will be reasons and political reasons uh, that he has not, and the Welsh Government have decided not to continue uh, with in the same way as we have continued. I suspect one of the issues is the context. Uh, you know, Wales voted to leave. Uh, and Scotland did not, and that is a significant factor. The makeup of the Welsh Parliament is 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 different. Um, so there are many of those reasons. But I said something I just want to repeat. I said last week in, in my statement in, in the chamber, I just want to repeat. Uh, I, I anticipate, both of us anticipate, continuing to work closely together on all of these issues. Uh, we do have a disagreement on this issue. And that is a disagreement which you know, we, we accept openly and no doubt we will discuss openly. But on most issues, we remain you know, very much focused on the same problems and trying to resolve them. Um, and I'm certainly not going to fall out with Mark. And I, I anticipate he's not going to fall out with me, uh, no matter the provocation from whatever side. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't expect you to fall out with him, uh, Minister. But, but I mean, given everything you've said up until now, you're working in lockstep, you're in exactly the same position, you can't envisage a situation where you depart. The, the difference in tone and language is quite striking, isn't it? Because you know, looking at what Mark Drakeford said just last week, and, and, and I'll just quote if I can from his, mm -hmm. his statement because it's quite important. He said this, the original draft bill meant powers already devolved, would have been clawed back by the UK government post-Brexit, and only ministers in London would have had the right to decide if and when they were passed back to the devolved parliaments. This was totally unacceptable and went against the will of the people of Wales who voted for devolution in two referendums. We are now in a different place. London has changed its position so that all powers and policy areas rest in Cardiff and Edinburgh, unless specified to be temporarily held by the UK government. These will be areas where we all agree common UK-wide rules are needed for the functioning of a UK internal market. London's willingness to listen to our concerns and enter serious negotiations has been welcome. And he sums it up by saying, this is a deal we can work with, which has required compromise on both sides. Our aim throughout these talks has been to protect devolution and make sure laws and policy in areas which are currently devolved remain devolved, and this we have achieved. That's a very different from the position you've outlined to us uh, this morning, uh, Minister, and surely, you know, given you've got three parties here, the UK government, the Welsh government and the Scottish government, two of those parties are now in agreement with very warm words about compromises and agreement on both sides and willingness. Surely the people left out of step are the Scottish government. And isn't this therefore more about you playing politics than it is about trying to find a solution as the Welsh have done? Well, well, let me take all of that apart from the last two sentences, which are, are, are clearly designed to, to be politically provocative, and I'm, I'm not going to get engaged in those. I've said to Mr Kelly quite clearly, I'm seeking a negotiated outcome. I will be seeking that today, and I will go on seeking that. So, uh, And I'm doing that on the basis of protecting uh, devolution. Um, I, I do not disguise, I disagree with Mark on that analysis. I will say that to him today, to his face, and no doubt we will discuss that issue. I disagree with that analysis because I believe that the changes to legislative competence which are being proposed are contrary to the devolution settlement. Now, we, ha we live in a country of asymmetric devolution. And Wales has only recently, I think on the 1st of April, uh, moved into the model of devolution in terms of reserve powers that we have. Um, I think there are significant differences in how we view devolution. Uh, because of that history and because of how we've operated. But there are also significant political differences uh, in the country in terms of nature of devolution and how it operates. Wales only got primary legislative powers 
uh, is it two, three, two or three years ago? I, uh, I mean, can't you know, I'm happy to check ago, it, yeah. but only two or three years ago. So there's a difference in devolution. There's a difference in political culture. There's a difference in the makeup of the parliament, and clearly a difference in analysis. Now, do you know, I have friends with whom I have a, a difference of political analysis. It does happen. I can still work with those people. Uh, I still enjoy their company, and I still think we've got lots in common. But from time to time, we have a different view. And on this matter, which you have outlined so well, but primarily because you've quoted Mark's own words, uh, then we have, a, we have a difference of view. You want to quote any more? Uh, I could happily spend the rest of the morning <laughs> quoting more, but I think I think we've, we, okay. we I think I've made the point, and the, and the minister, you know, has given given yeah, his view. And clearly, there's a different approach. Right. Alexander, uh, thank you, convener, uh, and I appreciate it may seem repetitive given your previous answer, but you know, you have repetitively told uh, you know, the media, parliament, MSPs, committees, including this one, you know, being in lockstep with Wales in exactly the same position, you know, and I won't quote the, you know, the numerous incidences, but you know, you've got the JMC this afternoon. So, how do you think changing your position? is going to affect Scotland's standing, you know, particularly around the agreement shown with the devolved uh, governments. Uh, and would you recognise this, this has probably weakened uh, the collective bargaining position of the devolved uh, bodies uh, by backtracking on your position? I don't understand the changing position. I haven't changed my position at all. I mean, the position we are in is perfectly consistent from the beginning. Um, but no, I, 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 I am where I am. I'm speaking as as the Scottish Government representative on the JMC this afternoon, and I will make the points that I've made to you. Um, I will also, as is my want, <coughs> come to that meeting with solutions rather than just problems. And uh, I will be at that meeting with two solutions which I believe uh, could be implemented. And I think that that is a strong position to be in. Um, because I also think, paradoxically, I said this, I think, in a television interview on, 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 on Sunday, paradoxically, I think this is easier to solve than it was last week because it's absolutely clear what will produce a solution. I mean, there's, there's no dubiety about it. We're not beating about the bush. There, the, a solution is in hand, and indeed, it's on the order paper of the House of Lords. I think that's a positive thing. Okay. Neil, you were just in the area of general negotiation. Are you still, has that been covered? Do you want to No, no, I just, um, my colleague Neil Finlay raised uh, the issue of cross-party working and, and perhaps a lack of a cross-party approach over recent weeks at the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, yesterday, further to that, given that the Welsh have a deal that we still have a current um, stalemate between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. And if the Joint Ministerial Committee today doesn't you know, provide a, a way forward, is it not time and would it not be uh, the responsible thing for this Parliament to establish some sort of cross-party delegation or commission to uh, find a way forward to negotiate uh, a deal that works for Scotland, a deal that can, everyone can get behind in this Parliament? Well, I, I, this is the, the responsibility of the government you know, to enter into negotiation with other governments and then to bring the results of that to the parliament. Now, I accept Neil Finlay's point, which he made to me yesterday at the Delegate Powers Committee, that uh, it, it, it would have been better to draw him and others in earlier last week, and I accept that, and I'm, I'm absolutely clear about that. I, I don't accept the point that was made to me by the Liberals that I should have, uh, I should have announced the Welsh position to the chamber. That's not only something I couldn't do, but uh, I didn't actually see the final letter from Wales until after I'd spoken. So in, in those circumstances, I don't agree with that. I did speak to Neil uh, Finlay last night, and I spoke to, to Richard Leonard last night, and I spoke to Willie Rennie yesterday, uh, and I'm in regular contact with others, and I have undertaken to make sure that there is uh, regular um, information provided uh, as we are in a very sensitive period at the moment. And we will meet and discuss these things, and I am very open to them. And at any time, if anybody wants to come and talk to me about it, uh, or I go and talk to people, I, I have informal conversations with Mr. Tompkins and others, and I, I think that's useful to have. If there is a possibility of us taking this forward and people have good ideas and they're being provided with information, then I think collectively we can, we can apply our minds to it. But there is a, a government responsibility here, and I think I must exercise that on behalf of the Scottish Government. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Right, well, final question. Uh, Minister, we, there's a GMC this afternoon. Um, have you, can you, at this stage, can you tell us what might be discussed? What's going to happen? Is this the last throw of the dice, or is there, no. or is there some way to go yet in terms of negotiation? Well, we we know what the timetable is because, presuming the House of Lords has its third stage on the 16th of May, and it may or may not, 
uh, that would be the last amending stage. And that's the time which we have to have a, a legislative consent motion. And so the timetable we've set for, uh, I, I think you will report before then and have a debate in the, in, the, in the chamber on the 15th, I think, is presently what is proposed. I'll go on discussing, negotiating, having ideas and trying to talk about this right up into the wire and you know, possibly beyond because I think it needs to be uh, resolved. The JMC today will consider, obviously this will be on the agenda, there will be other items on the agenda, you know, this is not the only thing that's being discussed, and I will report accordingly. Yeah, and one final question from Adam Tompkins. Sorry, um, uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, the, um, the supplementary legislative consent memorandum that the Scottish Government published in the last few days um, talks about a range of issues, and one of the issues that it talks about is the possibility of there being some sort of, not very well defined yet, that's not a criticism, but some sort of partial consent to the withdrawal bill. Um, and it seems, if I've got this right, um, it seems that the understanding is that in that event, bits of the withdrawal bill will sit alongside bits of the continuity bill, which Ashton and I referred to earlier, which we passed in this parliament by majority a few uh, weeks ago. Has there been any legal analysis or indeed political analysis on behalf of the Scottish Government or undertaken by the Scottish Government about the logistical compatibility of those two pieces of legislation sitting alongside one another? And well, if so, is, it, is there anything that the government can share well, uh, with the committee about that? I, I did refer to it extensively during the passage of the continuity bill. Uh, it's an area I think we dealt with quite extensively during that. I think the policy memorandum, uh, Gerald, deals with it too. It does. The policy memorandum, to the, which, which was responsible for, in the best possible sense, um, of, to, to the continuity bill, paragraphs 12 to 20, I think, uh, set out various scenarios for the operation of the continuity Indeed. bill alongside or in tandem with the withdrawal bill or not. Um, and we also discussed this with the Delegated Powers uh, Law Reform Committee yesterday. Um, so, yes, there, the, you know, the, there is an analysis set out in the public record. Look, I don't know if you want to... Uh, can, can I just say before, I, before I ask Luke to say a word on this, um, I think the, the official report of the Delegated Powers Committee tomorrow would be uh, yet, held yesterday would be helpful. Uh, because we did go into some detail about the range of options and how they sat together. Um, but Luke, do you want to...? I think the, the purpose of getting the continuity bill and some elements of the EU withdrawal bill to work together was, and this was set out during the passage of the bill, to protect the ability in appropriate <laughs> situations to continue to be able to make UK-wide fixes to deficiencies when they arose yeah. and where it was appropriate for a UK-wide fix to be made. Um, the Supplementary Legislative Consent Memorandum sets out some options for achieving that and the Minister went into more detail about that yesterday at the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The essential core of the proposition is that uh, a qualified consent would be given to Clause 7 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, allowing fixes to be made in devolved areas. Obviously, as uh, Professor Tompkins points out, you know, that would require some work to be done. We've been quite straightforward, that, uh, quite clear that it would require work on behalf of the UK government as well. But um, that, that's the intended operation of the two bills alongside each other. Okay. Its advantage would be it would, it would actually simplify the process, the, the complex process of the secondary, the, the burden of secondary legislation. I mean, the reason why I raise this is because, I mean, I, I, and I appreciate uh, and I recall what's said in the policy memorandum, but the policy memorandum is now a rather historic um, artifact. It relates to a bill pre-amendment and it relates to and it analyses a, um, an, a, 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 a withdrawal bill which, which also at that point had not been amended in the House of Lords. So it would be useful, I think, uh, Minister, if you would reflect mm -hmm. on whether the Parliament could be better and more fully informed before the 15th of May if that is indeed the date. Um, uh, yes, uh, on, 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 mm -hmm. on this question of the compatibility of the bills as they now are, or as they will be on that date, rather than as they were months, okay. weeks ago when the continuity bill was, was introduced. And also, of course, it is the case that a number of incompatibilities between the continuity bill and the withdrawal bill, which were not identified in the policy memorandum, were identified by opposition MSPs during the course of the passage of that bill through this place. I, I, and I think we should also, uh, it would be useful just to record the fact that I indicated yesterday that there are elements of the continuity bill, for example, in the <coughs> a, for example, in the sifting procedure, where we believe there are better procedures, which we will still try to have here, uh, no matter what takes place. But I will reflect upon that, see what we can do. Thank you. Okay, Minister. <coughs> Thank you for give, coming and giving us evidence today. I wish you the best of luck Thank at you. the GMC this afternoon. I now close this meeting. Okay.